The lesson from the Old Testament uh, this morning is found in Genesis 17, 1 through 8. It's found on uh, page 10 of the Old Testament. Listen for the word of God. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land where you are now an alien, all the land of Canaan, for a perpetual holding, and I will be their God. The lesson from the New Testament this morning is found in Matthew 1, verses 1 through 17, found on page 1 of the New Testament. An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah and Tamar, by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salom, and Salom the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Reboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah his, was father of Salathiel, and Salathiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abud, I don't, <laughs> and Abud the father of Elikim, and Elikim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Elud, and Elud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Matham, and Matham the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I've never wanted to clap after a scripture reading. Pray with me. Gracious and loving God, your faithfulness spans so many generations. 
more than the 14 from Abraham to David and the 14 from David to Babylon and more than, 14, more than the 14 from Babylon to your son. Help us to rest sure in your promises. Help us to rest sure in who you are. Reveal this to us by your word this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, for those of you who are here on January uh, 4th, you know that this is actually, 2015 is actually ending better for me than it started. Um, I was absent January 4th. Not many pastors get to say, I missed my very first Sunday and still be preaching at the end of that year. Um, so your graciousness and love have been duly noted and very much appreciated. But I want to go back to that question that I asked the kids. How long do you think you could keep a promise? How long have, I, we, we've got some spans here. The kids have an unfair advantage because some of us have a lot more years. And some of us have made far easier promises. For example, I remember uh, uh, probably over a decade ago now, I made a promise, a New Year's resolution, to never again make a resolution. And I've been doing great on that. Uh, it's, it's, it's been wonderful. I haven't had that pressure on me. And it's, every year I get to it, I think, do it. Nah, nah. And so it, we can make promises and we can have a longer span. But how long could we keep a good promise, a good secret? You know, we can have a, a fascination with secret keeping. <coughs> uh, we, we get intrigued. Uh, about 10 years ago, Dan Brown came out with the book, The Da Vinci Code. And one of the things that really intrigued us about, us, uh, intrigued us about Dan Brown's book, it was pretty well written, it, but this, this idea of a secret society, something that's hiding beneath the surface that isn't known to a lot of us. And we like that sort of intrigue. We like to look at, at things and say, oh, I wonder what's going on. And even the, the idea of a secret, a secret society, some of you might be uh, familiar with the Illuminati. Uh, a number of years, uh, about uh, eight or so years ago, 16 years ago, when the uh, second President Bush came into office, uh, and even when the first President Bush came into office and, and Secretary of State Kerry gets into his office, they were all part of a, a society at Yale called the Skull and Bone Society. These secret societies, things that, that really intrigue us, and, and, and what really gets us is the loyalty that these people have to these groups and how little gets known. There's a promise that gets kept, a, a promise that is made. And power and trustworthiness is seen in how well these people keep their promises to these organizations and to these things. <coughs> One problem with a mic right at your mouth. So what if a promise were kept over 2,000 years. What would we say about the promise keeper? What would we say about the organization? What would we say about the institution if over 2,000 years a promise was kept? That's exactly what we're seeing in the genealogy. I know it's hard to see because probably you looked at it and if you were here Christmas Eve, you were thinking, he's doing it again. Why on earth would you pick a genealogy of all things? I've fallen asleep during a sermon before. I've never done it during the scripture reading. <laughs> this is a new record. Write down 2015. But that's what we see. We see a record of God's faithfulness. We tend to gloss over this, all, all kidding aside, we gloss over it because to us it's just a record of names that to us mean little more than a record of our names of our ancestors from 250 years ago. No personal connection. And so it's hard to see the value at some time, at some point. 
And that's why it's important to remember scriptures like Genesis 17. <coughs> this summer, I preached over Genesis, did a series on Genesis, and if you were there and you happened to, to, to remember anything, you might remember I dealt with Abraham. And God makes several promises to Abraham, uh, chapter 17 being some of the most prominent. Prominent. And some of those promises include land, descendants, rulers that would come from Abraham, that all nations on the earth would be blessed through him. And, and the one we tend to overlook is the one that you can find echoed over and over and over again in the scriptures. And I will be your God and you will be my people. God's presence. God promises his presence. And God makes all these promises before Isaac and before Ishmael are born. <coughs> and so one of these, again, as we look at the genealogy, what we want to see are these promises. And is God going to make it true? Is God going to bring it come, uh, is God going to make it come to be? And as you might imagine, the answer is yes, but how do we get there? It starts with Abraham to recall his, his promises, but it moves to Isaac. And Isaac, of course, was the child of promise. God had promised to, to Abraham, you will have a child. If you recall, Sarah, in a good practical fashion, overheard this and started laughing. Because she was 99. I, I can appreciate why Sarah was laughing. And they tried through Sarah's maid, through Hagar, and Ishmael was born. But Ishmael wasn't the child of promise. It wasn't until Isaac was born that God showed his faithfulness that it wasn't going to be by Abraham and Sarah's scheming that the promise would come to be, but by God's own power and God's own faithfulness. And so Isaac, his birth was fundamentally unlike Ishmael's because it was entirely the work of God. Christmas Eve, we highlighted three women who, who typically don't get a lot of, uh, of uh, discussion in the church, I believe, anymore. Actually, a lot of the stuff in the Old Testament doesn't get a lot of uh, uh, as much discussion anymore. But Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth. Rahab is probably the most famous of the three of these, and you probably know why. <coughs> For at least one reason or another. But these three women have something, they actually have several things in common. First of all, can I state the obvious? They're women. And the fact that we have Matthew making a deliberate point to pull women into the genealogy is a statement in and of itself. It's a powerful statement that God is not just working through the patriarchal structures of their society. God is working through anyone and everyone whom he encounters. Rahab is probably the greatest example of faithfulness in that when God's armies came, she pulled in the spies and said, I know who's coming, and I know whose side I'm going to be on. And because of her declaration of loyalty to God, God was faithful to her. And she gets pulled in to this genealogy. She gets pulled in to this line of promise. Because God's faithfulness and God's goodness and God's graciousness to those who love him. The other thing that I want to mention is the fact that I kind of uh, mentioned here with Rahab is the three of these are not Israelites which is interesting in and of itself because we might expect that God's promise is going to come through God's chosen people. And we find that once again, as I mentioned in the Christmas Eve service, that God is willing to use anyone and everyone and he's willing to bring anyone in. 
<coughs> and so we see God's faithfulness. We see that God is going to work His promise and going to work His will no matter what. He's going to keep up His end of the deal. We would expect to find some, some royal uh, figures in the line because, of course, the, the Messiah is supposed to be a son of David, a son of the royal line of Israel. And indeed, we do get here finally. We get to King David, and, and from David to Jeconiah, these are all kings. It's not an exhaustive list of the kings of Israel and Judah, but it's a, it's a partial list. And it makes the point that Jesus is descended of that promised line. But the interesting thing is, who's in that list? We get some good kings. We get David and Solomon. We get Asa. We get jo uh, Jehoshaphat. We get Uzziah, Jotham, Hezekiah, and Josiah. These are all good kings in, in Israel's history. They were recorded well in Kings and Chronicles. Although some of them did have some failings. As I mentioned uh, Christmas Eve, uh, Matthew intentionally pulls in the fact that Solomon was the son of David by Uriah's wife. E. And others, Hezekiah falters at the end of his life. So they have their failings. And of course, Solomon falters in idolatry and, uh, and adultery. <coughs> but the interesting thing is who is included as well. We get some rather wicked kings, and the two that I want to highlight are the names of Ahaz and Manasseh. Interesting that these two are recorded. If you read back in Kings and Chronicles about Ahaz and Manasseh, these are not the people that you want in the Messiah's line. Ahaz and Manasseh both were not just uh, following foreign gods. Both of them permitted child sacrifice and Manasseh himself sacrificed his own son on an altar. Why would we include these? Because God is going to keep his promises. And when the monarchy falters and fails, we get to Babylon, we get to judgment. The exile to Babylon. It's like including the Dark Ages in this genealogy. We have a few names there that we understand. Salathiel, Zerubbabel, we understand those two. Those two are mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. In the Old Testament, Zerubbabel is actually a very interesting and important figure. I won't go into that today. I don't have the voice left for it. But after Zerubbabel, nothing is known about the people in the genealogy. Our knowledge on biography goes blank. But God's memory of his promise doesn't. There are total unknowns in the line of promise through whom God kept the promise. And then we come to the last two unknowns. Joseph, who was the husband of Mary. And with them comes the promised Messiah in the little, tiny town of Bethlehem. You know, at Christmas Eve, I made the point that God would work in and through anything. In some ways, the focus on, on Christmas Eve was more on the people in the genealogy, but as, as you've been getting throughout this, what I want to highlight is not the failings of the people, but the faithfulness of God. I want to highlight that faithfulness. Note all the ways that God kept his promise to Abraham. <coughs> Indeed, the man who had no sons at the time of the promise given had many sons, did become the father of na a nation. The father of multitudes, rulers came from him. Although it didn't always happen the way we might think or want it to. 
Because the evil came with the good, but the promise still endured. And God, no matter what the people in the genealogy did, God was still present. I will be your God, and you will be my people. The promise endures even today. The promise of God's presence, the promise of God's blessing to all the nations still endures today. And so this Christmas season, even as it and 2015 draws to a close, know that God keeps his promises. Even when it doesn't cash out the way we might like, even when you want your first sermon to be the best and you want the last sermon of the year to be preached with a strong voice. Even when you want family and friends to be a joyous coming, when you want the Christmas season to have a joyous coming together of family and friends and it doesn't quite pan out the way you want it to. When you begin, when you end the year with less people than you wanted to, whether physically or emotionally, know that God is still present and He's still keeping His promises. He is still our God and we are still His people. God doesn't forsake His people. And so enter 2016 knowing the faithfulness of God and the presence of God, which endures generation upon generation upon generation. Merry Christmas, church, and Happy New Year. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, I am so thankful for your faithfulness. Help seal this word in our hearts that we may live secure in your promises, secure in your faithfulness, that we may be people who find our hope and our center squarely in you. Teach us all the ways that you are faithful and grant us a strong sense of your presence. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.